Oh, from Kansas City, Missouri, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental. From my basement, I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle. Coming up in just a little bit, we're making him a partner. He's a member of the firm, Tommy Scoops. If you want to know what's happened with Brian Reynolds, don't go flavoring all those other uh, journalists out there. You go straight to Tom Bogert. To Tom Bogert, you go. We got to use air quotes when we say journalists about the the Brian oh Reynolds boy. saga because <laughs> there's some big bad burners out there that have not been getting a lot of stuff right. Oh boy, oh boy, that's also, uh, the MLS world for you. Also, I am going to push back real fast on this one. We are not making Tom a partner in soccer just okay. yet. He's an associate. He's yeah, an, he's associate an associate in okay. soccer. Junior, gotcha. Junior, Junior associate. associate. Yeah. Okay, we'll make yeah. sure to. Well, you and know what? Well, if he doesn't show up with coffee for us for this, then he's demoted back to the mailroom. And if they're not, if he cut someone's throat ruthlessly, <laughs> he could rise to the top very quickly. Also, we're going to need notes on every meeting. Wow. Uh, very <laughs> clear notes from you, Tom. So let us know. Uh, Produce and honors reminder of the day before we talk about the MLS Superdraft 2021 presented by Adidas. A wild top three in a lot of ways, mostly because the mock drafts out there were dead wrong. Philip Mayaka did All not go dead. first. That was Danny Pereira, all of them, every single one of them. I mean, they just crumple them up and throw them in the trash on the top three, uh, to be honest with you. We'll give our best picks, our overall thoughts, the team that won, and why Philly are winners for trading away every single pick that they have every year at this point. There's some trades, there are some signings, uh, there's some good mail, there's an interview with Hernan Losada, the new head coach of D.C. United. He was a big deal in Belgium, and he decided D.C. was his next uh, landing spot. He's only been a head coach for a year and a half, though. So interesting conversation with him coming right up. Uh, our producer, Andres, reminder of the day, though, is shout-out to WildDizzy213 on Twitter uh, and MLS memes for the Bernie Sanders MLS Draft Show meme. Andres really enjoyed that one, <laughs> as did I. I was willing to be uh, mittened for that occasion. So uh, go check it out at Extra Time Twitter. We retweeted that one if you want to see it. Let's get to the Super Draft. Doyle, uh, let's start with you, man. Overall thoughts, you did a ton of prep for this event, as you always do, went really deep. And then, really, as it always is, we're constantly surprised by where MLS teams go. It's just kind of nature of the beast. Yeah, it is. And that my overall thought was that, wow, this is really surprising. And that started with the first pick, and it uh, basically did not stop. Uh, <laughs> I think the only, like, I got a couple picks right. One was like Toronto getting a left back at the end of the first round. Like every other pick was wrong. Um, and it just goes to show, uh, you know, teams have their own internal big boards. They're not great about sharing them. They have no real interest in sharing them. It doesn't be benefit them and I don't blame them at all. And then of course, because this was the pandemic year and really only the ACC played and, you know, Kentucky had a few games and I think you know, a couple other teams, maybe South Florida had a few games. Um, scouting was even more haphazard. And the idea of who was where in terms of quality um, was even more scattershot than we've seen in the past. But Gasman actually kind of nailed it. Last week on this show, you said, look for teams to stay home a little bit more with their picks, to, to go with guys that they're familiar with. Danny Trejo, uh, Machete himself, going 14th overall to LAFC, was was a good example of that. He had been mocked around 20th, I think, so a little bit of a reach. And then the kid from Cal, Tommy Wilkinson, I'm not saying his name right, Tommy Williamson, uh, who had a very big 2019. You know, he's a center forward. He, he kind of fits the bill for what uh, for what San Jose need, but he wasn't on anybody's mock draft. Um, and he went 13th, I think, 12th to, to oh, the Quakes. So, 12th to the Quakes, yep. Yeah, so so teams had a really good idea of who was doing well in the colleges around them. And once you got past that like first seven or eight picks, that was kind of the theme of the draft. I thought yeah, it was interesting. You saw, well, you saw teams, I think they value different things in different ways. Some teams are not going to spend an international roster spot on a college player. Other teams don't mind because that's how they build out their roster. So I think you saw, while it was like best player available, one, I don't think there was a consensus on best player available as you got deeper into the draft or even at the beginning, yeah. technically. And then on top of that, best player available, but what am I willing to put into this? Some teams don't want a guy who's going to show up in preseason. Some teams only wanted someone who wasn't going to go back to college for the spring and show up in preseason. So I think that's where you had a lot of different value from teams. 
And that's where you start to see players move around that was unexpected going into it. There were some good moments on the Super Draft stream. I love doing it. I love being a part of that day for all these kids that are waiting on pins and needles. Uh, Luchi Gonzalez not realizing he was cued for his pick at 15 and accusing Charlie Davis of stealing his <laughs> look. That was a classic moment, I thought. Also, I just had to applaud you once again, Doyle. The Danny Trejo machete reference was seamless mm. in the show. And then, you know what? LAFC goes out and gets Danny Trejo. Like, actually, they go out and get the actor to do a welcome for their new forward from the draft, which is awesome as well. I mean, it's such a special day for all these kids to have the beginnings of their professional career. We all know that this is not some culmination. It is just that first step. Uh, so I thought that was cool. Let's go to uh, – how about our, our best pick? And we'll, we'll just do the first round. Actually, you know what? Rewind. Rewind on best pick. What happened in the top three? Like, basically everybody, everybody, everybody. I mean, you and Charlie are sitting on the – it's going to be Philip Mayaka. It's, and I look at all these mock drafts. It's Philip Mayaka. I talked to some other people out there. Oh, uh, you know, there is some disagreement. But, yeah, it's probably Philip Mayaka. Like, why wasn't it Philip Mayaka? Why was it Danny Pereira to Austin at one? What is this for Austin? And why did everybody get it wrong? Do we understand that at this point? Is there any sort of like bigger picture or knowledge that has been gained? Danny Pereira is really good. Like I, I had Philip Mayaka as number one, as everybody did, because I think he is um, he, just a supreme talent in terms of ball winning technique. Once he, you know, so ball security, and then the ability to advance from defense into the attack he doesn't create goals but he does all the dirty work to get guys into position the you know your high-priced attackers into positions to rip teams apart and to get that in the draft I thought it was just a no-brainer because guys like that don't miss you know the, the stuff that he does actually translates Danny Pereira he's a little more attacking and he's kind of a tweener right he's an eight with 10 tendencies or he's a 10 with eight tendencies and he doesn't cover quite as much ground and he doesn't really win the ball. So all of those little, I mean, those are, those are like flags. That's stuff like you have to go in and you have to work on it with him. Um, but he's, he's a superior passer of the ball. He's a better passer than Mayaka is. And he's a little more dynamic off the dribble. And I think, I mean, clearly from, from Austin's point of view, and maybe from Colorado's as well, because I believed they had traded up to three to get Danny Pereira um, as a Cole Bassett replacement. If they end up selling Cole Bassett, um, that made Pereira the better choice. And it's it's exciting because it's nice to see teams think a little differently than than what the consensus is. And I'm, I'm you know, stoked for the kid himself who has a, you know, a great backstory and um, it, by all accounts is, is just a fantastic kid. And, and but I, I'm really intrigued about how he's going to fit. So I because, think, wait, let me just say, say this, because with with Alex Ring, they have one of the best sixes in the league, but he's not just a sit and protect six. Alex Ring likes to go everywhere. He likes to cover ground. He's not going to, you know, he's not just going to sit and protect the back line. And so Pereira if he's playing as the eight is going to have to change his game. He's going to have to learn to think defense first for a good chunk of the game. And he never had to do that in college. If he's a playing as a 10, I mean, I'm not going to say it's unprecedented. We've seen tens come through the super draft before, but it doesn't happen very often. It'd be unusual to see a team spend so much money and then say, yeah, we're going to draft this kid to pull the strings in the attack. So it opens up all these questions that I have. And because of all that, I just thought Mayaka was the better fit. If you'd put Mayaka next to Rink, you don't have to worry about your deep central midfield. You can go out, whatever, get whatever 10 you want. So all these questions kind of kicking around my head. Um, Austin threw us for a big loop right from the start uh and then the chaos continued to to mount from there so i don't want to read everything into the draft but i think one of the things i saw coming out of this and i've heard stuff about it is this might be a team that plays with two eights in an advanced role so alex rings sitting behind two dual eights who cover ground and do different work or two tens however you want to call it and Pereira would fit into that model as doyle described his tendencies and again we don't know who the dp or whatever they're going to spend on the other player who will be there is so we can assume it's a, a federico Iguain style 10 because that's what we saw in columbus with greg but i don't 100 percent know that that's true and mm -hmm. so this pick 
kind of pushes, to Doyle's point of all the question marks it brings up, into that category of maybe that's what they're thinking of doing. Or the other thing is they like the things Pereira does a lot better and they think he can learn the things he doesn't. With Mayaka, they feel like they know who he is and they have an Alex ring already. And so can you turn Pereira into an elite eight is another question mark going forward. So I thought it was interesting from Austin from the same, a little surprised, but it may be showing their hand for the first time of what they want to set up as. Those top three, I think were pretty pretty clear to most people that those were the best three talents involved and that's why they went one two three I mean ultimately it comes down to in this sort of era of the super draft in my opinion you know fit and need comes into play but probably more middle back half of the first round than it does in those top three picks so you have Danny Pereira going to Austin Austin also picked up Freddie Kleeman center back out of Washington at 11 and Cincinnati took Calvin Harris and uh, Colorado got Philip Mayaka, which is a nice little consolation prize for them at three as they continue to build and build and build a young, talented roster. Before we get to our favorite picks, is Calvin Harris going to be in those, or can we talk about that one right now, FC Cincinnati? Because a lot of people were saying that was a little bit of a reach for them. Why go it's, there? I mean, it's not a reach. He was, you know, the, the same draft boards that had Mayaka as the consensus number one it had Calvin Harris as the consensus number two. So just in terms of, of pure talent, like, this is a guy – I've had people compare him to Albert Elise. You know, so, like, the, this is a, a potentially high-achieving MLS player. But if you look at, at that – if you if you look at that Cincinnati roster, they can't defend and they don't create chances. So you've just drafted a, a – I mean, by definition, every attacking player you get out of the draft is a project. And you're probably going to put him in a position where, where you're not – you're not giving him anything except, hey, create something yourself. Um, so it, it doesn't feel like, and he's also an international and they, they're maxed out on internationals. I think Gasman was saying they have two international goalkeepers on the roster. Yeah. Now maybe, maybe some of those guys get, get green cards. And well, this- is an international too. So they were screwed that's, up. No, that's, fair, but that's why we, that's why we all thought it would have been just take the best center, take the best right. domestic center back on, on the board. Like right. Ethan Bart, Ethan Bartlow is not. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be the next Chad Marshall, um, but he he's a you know he's going to be a very good I think MLS center back, and it just would have been, you know, you're not swinging for the fences here, but you're getting a base hit. Um, I'm mixing in other sports metaphors. <laughs> rest in peace, Hank. Rest in peace, Hank Aaron. And in an expert way, yeah. it's yeah. not a fall away three, but it's a very <laughs> fundamental fundamental layup there that you just you're right. yeah, exactly. Line. Yeah, you're at least at the least you're getting to the line. So. But we also all <laughs> said with Cincinnati, they need everything. Yeah, so whatever they were going to take, they were going to take. They think Calvin Harris an MLS attacker. Then that's the direction they're going to yeah, go. If you, don't have the structure, if you don't have the structure to get him into positions to 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 put the ball in the net, I mean, they they had a twenty million dollar attacker last year who scored one goal in like fourteen hundred minutes. Yeah, but if they added what they think is an elite one v one player on the wing who can draw defensive attention and create chances for that guy, then it works for them. In that, in the end, they needed everything. Okay. Yeah, I actually think central Pass midfield man, you have to is the least. Teacher. You have to change your T-shirt. You can't say all this nice stuff about Cincinnati while wearing a Crew SC T-shirt. I don't know how nice that was. Yeah. It was more like it was more like you know you got to pick up every other piece in the next like two months. Before At the, the least, I closes. would say their most depth is in central midfield. They just have players there that they paid money for. Whether they want to play them or not, they have no choice. I mean, they're five deep in those spots. Yeah, that's true. Maybe so. I'd understand not going that direction. I thought they'd go center back as well. Also, I thought every team was going to go center back. Yeah. So every team that didn't take a center back in every position <laughs> that's not Colorado and maybe not Austin, I didn't understand their draft. You had Ethan uh, Bartlow drop. He went to six, Houston Dynamo. Houston and Colorado swapped those three and six picks. And Great Derek draft. Jones. Great draft from Houston. Was a part of that too. So we'll talk about the Derek Jones trade. He is being reunited with that. That's what I was going to pick. Now I can't do it. You guys. Yeah, you can do it. All right, we're right in. Okay. Best pick of the first round. Best draft. uh, Just first round. Or you can expand it to second, third if you want to. There are a lot of passes though as we got into the third round. Uh, What do you got, Dave? What's your your best pick? What might it be? I'm on pins and needles. The two teams that traded down and got their center backs, one being Houston. Uh, They traded down, they got money, and then they got Bartlow, who's a GA center back. He's an MLS level starter in a dream world. Maybe you knock it out of the park and you get a Miles Robinson or Matt Hedges. If not, you still have a starter on a GA contract, a domestic, which is massive for any MLS team that's competitive. 
to have those pieces in place to then be allowed to use international spots or spend in the attacking spots. And Atlanta, who traded again, got money, got out of the first round, and probably got the player they were going to take anyway, somehow in the second round in Josh Bauer. What did they know? What did they know? I felt terrible for Josh Bauer. We're <laughs> sitting on that uh, New England pick at 24, and he lasted and lasted. And again, the mock drafts were wrong about him. And I'm thinking, you know what? Revs 2, trend with him before he went to Birmingham Legion. That's full of old Revs folk. They're going to take him here. It's going to be a, you know, it's all New England. And Charlie's hyped up, and we're just going after it. And we got the one shot just uh, all over, <laughs> all over him and his family in the living room. Oh man! And then Ed Kiza goes to New England. It just I felt like, I felt bad. I felt I, I didn't feel great about that moment. But a landing that's a good landing spot for him, whether it be to go straight into the first team or maybe to get seasoned with uh, with Atlanta too. Doyle, what's your uh, what's your pick? What's the one that stands out? And I'm gonna have to keep you out of that top three. It's Houston. Houston traded down from three to six. Uh, and they used the money they got for that to go out and get Derek Jones, who was a young number eight. So they got younger at central midfield. And then between Tim Parker uh, and, and Ethan Bartlow, they, their central defense is suddenly not ghastly anymore. You know, so they, they like they really did a good job, I think, of uh, addressing some needs and getting younger over the past couple of days. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how much of a difference that makes. Jones is going to have to do a better job. If he's going to be the number eight, he's going to have to do a better job staying tight um, and, and winning the ball. He, he likes to drift upfield and kind of be in number 10. Um, but nobody doubts that the talent is there. So they, they had a very good – I think they had a very good couple of days. I think and, that's a great use of ghastly, by the way. I really <laughs> appreciated that word choice. And I would just say outside of the draft, I don't think that Houston's ceiling has gone up a whole lot, but they went from – a lot of middle to low price international players to a bunch of MLS players. Yeah. Like they've just added MLS players. Joe Corona's not going to change maybe winning an MLS cup. Derek Jones might not do that, but you bring in Pico, you bring in Tim Parker, Uruti, whatever it is, the bottom of this team has gotten better. The middle of this roster has gotten better. And yeah. so they should be a stronger team week to week because of what they've done, which I think is a good start because they got, they did a great job getting a lease, but they haven't, followed that up by doing that consistently. So don't focus on trying to get a top eight player in MLS because that's pretty hard to do. And they've just gotten better overall. I mean, they've and got the, the, other th they've the, other got the thing dice roll on Bijamish, right? Like, I, I'm yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, right. seven, that's a seven figure dice roll. So right. they don't that's think, the dice think, roll, right? They so don't, think, not, you, they you don't gotta, think it's a dice roll, my friend. They think that's a sure thing. They're spending that type of money. Well, I'll tell you a lot yeah. about about yeah, what no, teams I, have thought I, have been sure I, things and have I not turned out to be that way. You, so yeah. it's still, you know, they're still rolling the dice. They're just thinking they got the odds behind them. Uh, look, Derek Jones, the best he's looked probably in his career is with Tab. No? Yeah. So yeah. This, this, this is one of those moves where I, I think about Major League Soccer and I look at some of the players that sort of get buried, and that's not to say that Derek Jones got buried with Nashville. He got some run last year. But you said on the last show, fit and opportunity, Doyle. That applies to more than super draft picks. Yeah. That applies to a lot of players in this league. And I am personally someone who thinks that that international trade market should be more robust and busy with teams saying, look, it's just not working here. And other teams looking across the line and being like, it would be perfect here. We know him. We think it will work here. We're willing to take the risk and have some money fly around that way. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Minnesota Had to. for my, my first pick. round. Love just. It. I just love, because, love it. just because. First of all, Adrian Heath and I, you know how close we are. You know how over the years our relationship has really grown and blossomed. Um, but no, I mean, like you look at their recent history, it's pretty darn good. It's pretty darn good. So I think that tells you that they probably have a good handle on their scouting process and on how they want to do this. And by the way, they have to because their academy is basically mm -hmm. a, a non-entity at this point when it comes to impacting the first team or maybe even outside of that. To be honest with you, I haven't been following some of those news updates as closely as I once was. But I think in Justin McMaster, they got a guy who has something but has been sort of damaged goods because of an injury. But a guy who was in the Union Academy, Union didn't uh, didn't pull him up, but at Wake in a great program, did his knee, I believe, and now is coming back from that. If they think that the potential is there, maybe they can bring that along. And then I think the Nabi Kibanguchi was a good pick too. I'm going to shout out Evan Ream. Definitely talked to Evan Ream a ton about this. Of course, he knows everything there is to know about UC Davis and Sacramento mm -hmm. and soccer in that neck of the woods. Uh, and he was saying that, that this this kid is really, really good. Can play both the six at center back, 
uh, rangy, big, physical. Uh, and so I think those are two really good sort of, you know, hey, what's it going to be picks yeah. for Minnesota that potentially have some real upside? And, and Kid Gucci probably has a floor that means very usable MLS player. So I, I thought that for Minnesota to get those guys at the latter half at 17 and 18, and they moved up to do that as well, I thought that looked like uh, good business for them. Do we want to have this Philly conversation right now? Yeah, let's do it. Because Travis Clark at MLSsoccer.com graded all the picks. The only team to get an A-plus was the team that traded away every single one of their picks and did so proudly. Not just proudly, like giddily, I feel. I, I think Ernst Tanner is just out there waiting. He's like, somebody give me something. 50K and some future considerations. Get them off my hands. I don't want these, man. It's like a garage sale. Yeah, so, is, so it is, is it deserved? Is the A-plus deserved? I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a perfect description of what happened because they traded their first round pick to get the rights to Nathan Harrell as a homegrown, which mm -hmm. that's the player they picked. That's what they did. And Nathan Harrell, I think, is an MLS right back and will be over the next few years. And obviously they think he has a higher ceiling than that. But I will say this. MLS teams, they have somewhat limited resources as every organization in the world. There are like six ways to build a team and acquire players. Very few teams can do all six really well. And in an ideal world, every team would do them all well because they'd have enough to pay seven scouts in South America and 10 scouts to go through college and get the right DPs and nail your MLS signings. Not every team can do that. If you're going to corner yourself, you have to be good at it. So Minnesota's done that in the draft because Minnesota has no academy. So that's what they do. They push there. Philly's done that in the draft. It, sorry, with homegrowns, that's the way they've operated. Now you have to hit on more than one to be a great team in MLS. I think Toronto did that. We saw Atlanta. They hit in the Super Draft, and they hit on their international signings, and then they hit on their MLS whatever uh, acquisitions to win MLS Cup. And Philly did that over the last two years. They hit on their international signings, and they hit on their homegrowns. They don't put the resources into doing well in the Super Draft. That's fine because they put their resources in other places. There are some teams in this draft who passed on picks and don't have a robust academy and haven't nailed big DPs from overseas. Those are the ones where it's, what are they doing? So I think for Philly, they've chosen their lanes and they want to try and perfect them rather than trying to deal in all six lanes. Also, is, Philly has starters that came out of the Super Draft. I mean, that's they, what they I was it's, it's like, like they have Andre Blake. He's the reigning goalkeeper of the year. Jack Elliott is going to go back into the starting lineup. He has been a massive player for them uh, the past few years. I Come like, on, go I, with I, West Virginia. Say his name. Say his name. Oh, Ray Gattis. Yeah, those are I mean, different I know. It's a different, it's a different sort Blake of... Blake uh, and Gattis have nothing to yeah, do Yeah, it's a different group of decision makers. No doubt for, about it. For sure. It, but it... That just, to me, it speaks to the fact that there is talent in the draft um, that is worth bringing into camp and taking a look at. Uh, it's, it's one of the few things Philly do as an organization that I, I'm not I, – like, I, I totally understand the, the trade for Harriel. I totally get that. I think that if, if you believe in Harriel's, you know, upside, that is a perfectly good way – to use a first round draft pick. Um, I, I think just passing on the rest of the draft, I, I, maybe it won't come back to bite them. Their academy is very, very good. Um, but it just feels like, like in MLS, you got to kick over every stone, especially if you're not going to spend huge on top tier DPs. Um, and it just feels like leaving a stone unturned on Philly's part. Is it a stone unturned? And I agree with your logic there. Like you might as well. There's very little risk for you in that sense. But they didn't or, pass. They traded them. No, right. for sure. Or is it a message? And it's a message to the kids that are in your academy or also the kids that might come into your academy in the future because we see recruitment being such a big part of that world these days. I mean, Sporting KC signed three kids. I don't think – I'm not sure any of them were Kansas City kids mm -hmm. recently, and we've seen what they've done. Maybe Philly's just saying, and Ernst Tanner is saying, come here because if you're here – don't worry about the super draft. If yeah, you're, you're good the enough, priority. You, you will be in our team. We care I'm about sorry. you more. Ernst Tanner just sold Brendan Aronson to a Champions League team and Mark McKenzie to Gank. I don't think the way he's raising that flag that's is fair. by passing in the third <laughs> round of the super draft. That's fair. He's just like showing – he's like money, money, Champions League players. That's what we do. Uh, let's bring on a legend, oh, a growing boy. legend, a junior associate producer here <laughs> at Extra Time, Tom Boger, Tommy Scoops. 
I tried to make you a partner, Tom, and uh, Doyle nope. Doyle knows that the office politics here can't allow that. You would just get smashed down far too quickly. So welcome to the welcome to the firm. Yeah, we're doing uh, it to protect you, Tom. Yes. We don't want mm-hmm. you to have a target on your back. Doyle, <laughs> Judas, didn't expect that one happening. All right, guys, nice start to my Friday here. Yeah, are we going to expect you to grind like 24 hours a day while we hit the golf course? <laughs> uh, potentially. That's the way some of these things work. That's uh, the way this talk- works, my friend. Yeah, that's the world, man. That's the world. Before we talk about Brian Reynolds and the saga they're in, Paul Ariola, Jesus Murillo and LAFC, maybe even a little bit of craziness in Cincinnati, we haven't really dug into Colorado and Philip Mayaka here. I know you talked to Porg Smith about that yesterday. Walk us through that pick for them and what they see. Um, they were pretty giddy. Um, he didn't, uh, Porg didn't say it directly or anything, but I got the vibe that they were not expecting Philip Mayaka to be there at number three. Um, but their logic for trading into the draft, first they wanted to move up to number six to, and as he put it, kind of influence the generation Adidas decisions, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and then that gave them the launching pad to then move into the top three because they viewed this draft as there were three top players clear cut and it didn't matter which one of the three necessarily that they got. They saw the value in being in the top three and they, you know, walk away just delighted that Philip Mayaka fell there. They think that he was the best talent in the draft. They think that, you know, he, they, they drafted based on best talent available, not fit. Um, he, he's, he's a different kind of player, obviously than Jack price at, at defensive midfield, but their central midfield is pretty stacked. Um, I would, wouldn't expect anything to happen with Cole Bissett soon, but it'd be folly to kind of put out expectations. So he'll have, you know, a real fight to get minutes, but um, the Colorado are really, really high on him. All right, let's do what we came here to do. Tommy Scoops, let's go! Owning it, baby! Nobody knows the Brian Reynolds saga <laughs> like you do. Nobody knows what's happening. Juventus? Nah. Roma, they're in the driver's seat. Uh, you tell the story, man. Like, where is this? Uh, what's happening? How you feeling? Cloud nine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not not about me. It's about Brian. Hopefully, getting his dream move finally after this saga. Like, I was first talking to people about this like before Thanksgiving. Like, it's if you asked me around then or the first week of December, I would have been shocked that no deal was agreed upon before January first. Like, it's kind of wild how this is all played out. You know. There's been bits and pieces on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean about, you know, what's happening. There was widespread reports of done deals with Juventus. And look, I mean, maybe I just have a different uh, definition of, of what the word done means, because for, for, for me, like not, that wasn't even meant to be a shot as you guys chuck in the background. But I, I use that as done deal is when the deals agreed upon, medical's done and the paperwork is filed. Um, I use agreed in principle for anything before that. And. You know, the reports, I guess, then it were that it was agreed in principle with Juventus, but Dallas didn't have anything official in in offers or writing or anything from Juventus or Benevento or however it had to work. So all of those reports that it, that was just not, you know, totally there yet, because, again, Dallas didn't have anything in writing that that said, OK, this is our offer. This is how much we're going to pay. This is the payment schedule. This is when you're going to get your money, et cetera, et cetera. And Roma kind of fell out. Um, in, in throughout December, they they kind of fell to a distant third behind um, Juventus and Club Bruges. So I figured that it was just going to end up at Juventus because when they kind of come into the room, it's difficult to say no, and they can obviously outbid anybody. And and it's pretty hard if for Brian Reynolds to oh wow Juventus like I can go play there. Ronaldo, West McKinney, that'd be cool. But they never sealed the deal. And Roma, even the communication stopped between Roma and Dallas and, and Reynolds's camp uh, on kind of the last week or so of December. And then they had a new GM that finally started on January 1st. And he immediately kind of revived discussions. And, and the, they have an American ownership group that kind of helped sweeten this too. And and look, I, I caution it to, to be done, particularly with something with this saga that refuses to end. It, it seems never ending. As um, So I, I won't say everything's all done, but agreed in principle right now is what I'm comfortable with. Um, but I think that we should wait to use the word done until you see Brian taking a picture holding the, the Roma shirt and, and he's doing the goodbye interviews with Dallas and the hello interviews in Rome. Tommy, why did Juve get cold feet? There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. Um, and and I'm, I'm not necessarily sure how, how much of cold feet it was it, or in that they just didn't get to seal the deal. And and again, payment structure is another thing that, that uh, was pretty glaring with this one. Um, 
he would have had to go to Benevento first and and that just kind of didn't really jive well because there was no I guess assurances that you know payments were going to come immediately or or you know there there was just a little bit too much cloudy in there that that didn't really work and again they, they never got the deal agreed and they kept the door open for Roma who, who just said okay well we have the EU spots as far as uh, as I latest I've understood is they have the EU spots for Brian so he doesn't need to go on loan and that just makes it you know just such a more palatable deal for player and club you got Taylor Twelman reporting uh, recently talking about payment schedules and money uh, that the payments with Boa Vista for Reggie Cannon have been a little bit Let's call them cloudy as well. Uh, Not exactly arriving on time, which makes sense given what's happening with Boa Vista and their ownership Mm. structure and everything around that. Uh, For Brian Reynolds, what does this move mean in your mind? I mean, Serie A, we don't see a ton of moves for American players straight to Serie A. I mean, Weston McKinney playing there has honestly been sort of a breath of fresh air for those of that hasn't watched it with with much on the line recently. Mm. Why Roma? Uh, Is it a good place for him? What do you know about that situation? So I think it's awesome. Um, you know, Club Bruges also would have been a really strong option in, in the same um, argument and, and theory that we all celebrated. Brendan Aronson going to Salzburg and Mark McKenzie going to Genk. It's, you know, there's a club where he's going to play every single game, you know, in a weaker league than Italy. So even if he's not totally ready yet, he would get to work through the, a little bit of growing pains as he found his feet and, and playing for a team that I don't, I don't know which European competition they're in, but they're always in in one of them <laughs> when, when it comes to qualification. But, you know, I do believe that Roma actually is the best place for him because one, he doesn't, he won't need to go on loan first, which, which I think is huge. So then you can kind of treat this, the uh, second half of this, the European season right now as this is how he finds his feet, keep the expectations low. Um, and, and he's going to prove it in training, get, get acclimated to a new league and a new culture and all of that. And then hopefully he can start moving into a position where he's challenging for regular minutes, um, in you know the preseason over the summer but as as you alluded to where there's not a lot of american players going directly to italy that's how much that they value him they're using one of their non-eu spots um in italy you can only sign two non-european players per season like that's huge like that's incredible and and obviously that goes without saying how high they are in a given you know the financial um investment they're going to be making in them with a fee that could rise to around 11 million depending on where it sits with incentives and, and, and whatever else comes in the deals. But it's, it's wild. This is incredible. Like this is a player who has 15 MLS starts, 14 of which came uh, over the last few months after Reggie Cannon was sold. Like I laughed at, at, at first when there was rumors of, of Juventus being interested. I was like, really? Like that sounds weird. Like maybe, maybe his second transfer once he gets to Europe. And then the more and more I learned about it, it was like, Whoa, Juventus, Roma, Inter Milan, AC Milan, like uh, Bruges, like, you name all these clubs and, and you, English clubs weren't involved because they their work permit issues are, are much more stringent than Italy. Or maybe we'd be talking about English teams being interested in it. It's just, you know, really wild. And, and it's incredible, I guess. You know, could you have imagined this? Doyle, we, we've talked about this. Could you imagine yeah. that there there could be a calendar year where, you know, Dest moves to Barcelona and, and Reynolds moves to Roma and potentially Cannon moves to another club? Like, these are just right backs. And it's insane. Yeah. No, it's, it's we've become, you know the right back exporter to the world so far and, and I guess more to come. So, but no, it's, it's, it's insane and it's exciting. Um, and another guy who's played right back and there are, uh, you know, some reports and in, in out there now, um, but is not a right back. Uh, Paul Ariel to Swansea. Tell us, tell us what you have heard about, uh, about Ariel. That's just an extra transition. That's why they pay you the big No, that money. was that incredible. was rough, man. That was rough. That was herky jerky. You'd make a basketball yeah, reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Herky jerky to the rim. Yeah, that's you got why, there, I, but that's why I usually leave this to Weeby. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Swansea City are um, as, as Doug McIntyre first reported, and I was able to confirm uh, Swansea City are, are genuinely interested in Paul Ariola and uh, United uh, GM Dave Casper also confirmed it um, on, on a press conference earlier this morning that. Their discussions are ongoing with Swansea. Um, they they obviously have the heart out when it comes to the transfer window closing at the end of the month. So we're going to have a resolution within the next week of whether or not Paul is going to join probably almost definitely Jordan Morris at, at Swansea. And, and this wasn't an either or scenario for Swansea City. It wasn't like, oh, in case Jordan Morris falls through, then we're going to do Paul Ariola. No, this was a, you know, they want both of them. Um, and going back to roster rules and whatnot, and my, the extent of, of my roster rule knowledge when it comes to the England championship uh, comes from my 
extensive playing of football manager, so I don't know how um, direct this is. But as far as my understanding is, they can only have five loan players in the match day squad. They already have a couple players on loan, and Jordan Morris's deal and and potentially Paul's deal would be loan with option to buy, uh, most likely around whether or not they get promoted to the Premier League. So they might have some maneuvering to do there. They might not. Like I, I don't know the specifics and how that might work, but. If Ariola goes, they play in a 3-5-2, so he'd likely be pegged for that wing-back role, which, you know, I, I can hear Doyle. That's why I was trying to make the, the right-back, <laughs> right-wing. It didn't work. It was, it was I a got it. I understood. Strategy. I picked it up. <laughs> anyway. uh, but, yeah, so the, and I think that that would be a really good position for him, too. But, obviously, I'm sure if you're Paul, you want to play in an attacking role for someone who's been so versatile and somebody who's always said yes to, to whatever needed, when, whether it comes to left-wing, right-wing, right-back, wing-back, uh, even a little bit <clears throat> as a number 10. But, um, Swansea are, are currently sitting second in the championship, which would be an automatic promotion spot. They're, I think, like six or eight points behind Norwich City in first place. Uh, but, you know, a lot can change over the remaining 20 matches uh, in the Champo, as, as we all know. And, and third through six goes to the playoff to get that third promotion spot. So um, they, they believe that, you know, Ariola and Morris could really push their promotion um, dreams to reality. This Boy, has those... to be a dream scenario for DC, right? Yeah, it feels, feels a little bit. Um, yes, but it depends on the fee. Um, I don't know the total specifics, but, uh, Club Tijuana have a very hefty sell on uh, percentage in Paul Areola. So, um, it really just kind of depends on what that option, uh, purchase option would be. Interesting. It's interesting. All right. Let's talk uh, about Jesus Murillo. It's a done deal. We don't have to do the like agreed in principle or all the, you know, like all the maneuvering around that sort of thing. This is a big signing for LAFC. We saw the hole that Walker Zimmerman left. They went out and filled it. And now they don't have to, you know, kind of be wishy washy. It's Jesus Murillo. He's their guy. Yeah. And, and that was a really important business from LAFC. And it, it shouldn't be a surprise because. You know, you saw with, with their CONCACAF Champions League run, he was playing, whereas a couple players who were in limbo, including Bradley Wright Phillips, who didn't return, wasn't playing in the CCL. So I think it, the expectation was that a deal was going to get done. It made sense for everybody. Murillo, from the day he got there, was, okay, he's clearly a, our starting center back. He's clearly our partner for Eddie Segura. Um, and, you know, LAFC had some troubles on the back line last year in 2020 because that Murillo was – ostensibly the Walker Zimmerman replacement and he didn't arrive until like October 15th. So they spent the first 75% of the season without, you know, a real replacement at center back. And while, you know, their, their plans at right back kind of fell through. So they, they've got Mario sorted, which is, you know, getting huge news and him and Segura have been, you know, a really good partnership, but they also signed uh, Kim Moon Juan, Juan Moon. I, don't know, I wish I had it written down in front of me. That would have been easier. Anyway, Moon is a South Korean international right back. So, that's fortified. You don't have to worry about Latif Blessing having to play there. You know, you, you, now you have Murillo back, which they, they really needed. Now they have a really strong uh, starting center back partnership. They traded for Marco Farfan, and he's going to be really good as a rotational piece at left back for that team because you'd expect Diego Palacios to miss time with, you know, all the international dates coming up in 2021. And then you have Tristan Blackman, who is with the U.S. national team right now and, and is somebody who was really impressive on their CCL run. And he's somebody who could play center back and right back. So, LAFC just went from a question mark as of October 1st on that back line and a, and a big one at that to, okay, this might be the LAFC we're, you know, already, <clears throat> already used to. We got to get you some water, Tommy. How's that hangover doing, bud? I, I guess uh, dry January ended pretty abruptly yesterday. Huh? <laughs> that was uh, berries from a fruit smoothie getting stuck in my throat. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 it's uh, just that, a little flaxy. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. They, they did my, uh, you know, my blender doesn't break those down <laughs> quite as well. So, all right. How about get out your BS meter? Papu Gomez to FC Cincinnati. Um, I have no idea. This is another one that's had a ton of reports. Um, wouldn't surprise me if, if, if Cincinnati are interested. They should be interested if, if they have a realistic chance at getting him. But he's been on the record, like, uh, multiple interviews that his next spot, he wants to be in Champions League. And uh, last I checked, Cincinnati didn't qualify for the CONCACAF Champions League. So maybe in 2022, they have a chance at bringing him in. But um, it'd be an incredible coup if they could bring it down. But, you know, I would just be uh, pretty dubious right now because of, you know, the quality and the stature of that player. Mm, your BS meter going off. You didn't make the, like, beeping noises I was hoping <laughs> for, but, yeah, we all heard him. We all heard him. All right, before I let you go, anything else you're watching? 
Anything else you're thinking about? Do you want to bring the dog into the frame? <laughs> Open floor for you, Tom. No, I, I, I made sure to put him outside. I'm sure he's laying outside of my, my office door. Very sad. Usually it's just like soft. Like, oh, come on. Why'd you do that? Why can't I? Why can't I be a part of it? But, you know, <laughs> so maybe next time. All right. Maybe next time. Tell people how they can follow you. Just uh, Twitter at Tom Bogart. That's pretty easy. All right. Thanks, Where are you Tom. you going to get the blue check mark, dude? Because you broke the you broke the Roma stuff, and then all these blue check marks start breaking it. Thirty minutes later, not crediting you. I mean, come on, you, you gotta get you gotta work with Twitter a little bit. See if you can get you know verified. Some stuff's got to happen for you, Tom. Come on, I'm not that self important or self serious. Uh, I think it's I think it's funnier to not have a blue check. <laughs> we'll see. Mm, we'll that's see what people without that. blue checks say. <laughs> not gonna lie. That, if you don't have a blue check, you know that's yeah. how I felt before too. I was like, I'm punk rock, and then I got the blue check, and I was like. Nah, this is better. This is that, better. That, so should have done the at, meter there. You should have been beeping like you told yeah, me. Exactly. <laughs> at, at Twitter, at Tom Bogert, anybody listening to this show, please, we need a groundswell. We need a grassroots movement to get Tom Bogert, Tommy Scoops, verified by Twitter. So let's oh, do it. Boy. I will start it. Everybody just read, pound on the retweets. We'll put it out from extra time. We are going to get Tom Bogert verified. Tom, thank you so much for your insight, man. Cheers, fellas. Thanks for having me. Yep, no doubt. All right, let's keep it rolling. This is an interesting one. Bobby Wood reportedly, no, rumored, Sam reported this one. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. It is, I mean, Sam knows RSL back to front. We love Sam Stage. Go follow his work at The Athletic. He's saying Bobby Wood to RSL is going to get done. That Basically, Bobby's finishing off getting paid with Hamburg, which, yeah, get paid, Bobby, get paid. Uh, and then he will join up with RSL on a TAM deal. Do you guys like this signing for RSL? What do you think, Dave? Uh, yeah, it's a guy who was making $3 million this year and you're getting him on a TAM deal and he's domestic. And I'm still here for the RSL 2021 is like Phoenix Suns 2010, where everyone like comes to the mountains. They just get all the old creaky knees to work again and work everything out in altitude and everyone just gets refurbished. And you got a front line of Rubio Rubin and Bobby Wood. Tell Giuseppe Rossi to come back in and let's just run it back. This is what yeah, but that mountain air didn't work for for Rossi, unfortunately. No, so make you know, not. but look and look, Rubio Rubin's only twenty four. Scored like, four goals and five five goals and four appearances for San Diego last year uh, in his short time under Landon Donovan at USL. Listen, there's no ownership, there's no direction with this team. So right now, you're just trying to make decent deals to not hamper yourself down the road. And these are all deals that kind of fit that. It's a positional need if it hits. You hit the lottery, and if it doesn't, it doesn't kill you going forward. It's Tam, though. That's a lot. It's not a lot. really. It's a lot. Of, like it by definition, it means it's a it's a it's a max salary hit on on the cap. When's, when's the last time Bobby Wood scored a goal? Three years, years ago. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Hamburg is Hamburg's been last, freezing him out. The last time he's been he's, freezing him out. Doyle. The last time he scored a goal was November twenty fifth. 2018 and yeah yeah he's been frozen out for a good bit and he's also missed a good bit of time with knee problems he also went on loan and didn't do anything there uh i, I you know bobby wood before 2018 would have been a really really good bet um now it's a it's a less good bet i understand why they're making it though because oh, he, he is bobby still 28 for 2018 was a dp so they don't have to spend any of that, and if they get lucky or do it right, they could get a DP quality player for Tam money. And that's I, kind of where RSL sits. And I and I hope they do because Bobby Wood has scored some big goals for club and country. He has shown the ability to score those kind of tough and, and, and scrappy Concacaf goals. Um, but it's been it's been two and a half years since he scored a professional goal. Can I, I throw it. this in there from just a personal enjoyment perspective? Yeah, can I throw this in there? I think Casper Shabilko had two goals in two or three years coming into Philly from Kaizen Slaughter. So okay. it's happened before. Uh, yeah. This is a this is a personal enjoyment win for me to see Bobby Wood in MLS at 28. I know he's played a ton of games or not played a ton of games depending on the time of his career in Europe. But like this is what I want to see. I want to see guys like that that are kind of down on their luck but have this past history and this connection that we have with them. I want to see him every single week. And we have Bobby on this show a number of times. He is like a real thinker, is the way I'll put it. Like, he does not shy away from tough conversations. So I'm looking forward to having him on the show and uh, him getting a little bit of a fresh start because he got his money in Hamburg. Props to him. Well done. Now he's coming to RSL. See what he can do. Uh, how about this, though? Here's a question from the mailbag. 
Who would you take if the money was the same? And this is for you, Doyle. How about Bobby Wood or Aaron Johansson if you're RSL? And you cannot say neither. Bobby Wood. I I would take Bobby Wood in a heartbeat over Aaron Johansson. Uh, Johansson, like he he had one very, very good year in the Eredivisie, um, but that was more than half a decade ago. He just, he got healthy at 30 and scored a bunch of goals this past year, but it was in Sweden. And if you look at the goals he was scoring, it was against bottom half of the table teams in the Swedish league. That's like USL level, like below USL level. So it's like, the, there's no question I would take Bobby Wood. I just keep thinking about Bobby's season at Urza Burger. <laughs> you never <laughs> say that one. Always just had fun making it up. Let's talk about trophies. Anybody excited about trophies to San Jose? How you feel about that? A little Chivas reserve-ish number 10, but Just certainly. To point out for you, so La Chofis is his nickname, and it is because he looked the same as another player on Chivas' girlfriend, and that was her nickname. So that's why he's called La, not L, and Chofis, which I don't know if that's – uh, negative. I don't know what's going on there. I yeah, just, I don't know. That, that's, that's a just, lot to absorb. Everyone gets introduced to the full story. That's part of what's happening. He uh, played pretty well under Almeida at Chivas. There was some rumors around a European move for him, whatever. Didn't happen. Almeida leaves. He basically hasn't played well since he left, and uh, he was suspended over a part of the last season by Chivas. I think it was COVID-related stuff. I'm not 100% sure. So this is a pretty down on your luck player who Almeida trusts and Carlos Fierro, Osvaldo Alaniz starting to become a trend. Uh, Almeida brings in guys that he thinks he can get more out of. This will be their 10 though. They lost Erickson. They played Andy Rios in there, which made no sense. So this is the guy who's probably going to fill that position. And when you look across MLS at what teams spend at that position, it kind of puts San Jose in a block of where they stand in this league because that's the spot where teams kill it. And that's where Zellarion comes from and Pasuel and all that. And I don't think Lopez is on that level. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Jao Paulo's back. Uh, despite Anders, we will not talk about that for any longer <laughs> than this. So I'll take one more breath. DP spot. And we move it on. Andres Guardado to Charlotte. That's getting reported out here. I don't know by who. Anders just added it to the rundown live. <laughs> Says he uh, is going to come for 2022, but he'll be mid-30s at that point. Hmm. Yay, nay. He still plays. He's like when healthy. I think he's a starter for Betty's, which has been good this year, but he hasn't been healthy the whole year. I don't know. This is one of those where we've all been waiting for 15 years. We've already talked about it so many times. I know. That now it's like, eh. yeah. We'll see if it happens. We know what did happen in D.C., though. Hernan Losada is their head coach. They surprised some folks out there by going to Europe and plucking him out of Belgium. We're happy to have uh, him on the show right now. Hernan, welcome to Extra Time. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Thanks We're for... doing good. We're looking forward to meeting you, man. As soon as I saw the rumors come out, as soon as I started to look into the backstory and your career, we got a little bit excited. I'm not going to lie. Are, how excited are you? Tell me how all this came to be. It seemed like it happened fast. Uh, actually, it happens very, very fast, yes. Uh, indeed, um, I'm also looking forward. I'm as excited as you are, guys. Uh, so I hope uh, I can be in DC as quick as possible and, and meet uh, meet my my teammates, uh, all the the club, uh, the players, uh, the staff. So I'm really looking forward for this new opportunity and new challenge. How fast is the question here? You're the manager of Beershot. You have an you have an intense connection to this club. You've brought them up from. Uh, the second division, and you're doing pretty well. And then what happens? How does it happen that then you say, okay, okay, there's a better opportunity or there's a different opportunity and I must take it? Yeah, everything started uh, a few weeks ago. We made contact for the first time with Dave and Stuart uh, from DC. Uh, we had a very good chat, um, a very positive I really felt uh, there was a click between us. Uh, we were in the, on the same page. We wanted the same things. And uh, after the second meeting with the owners, um, everything went uh, real quick, real fast. I need to make a decision, and the decision has, has been made. Um, I, I didn't have any doubts. Uh, I really believe this is a, a new opportunity, a new chapter, a new step in my career. Um, I, I reached the top with Bershkot. Uh 
I believe I couldn't do better than that. Uh, uh, being promoted from second to first, uh, being even the top of the league in first division after 14 games, with one of the smallest smallest budgets uh, in the competition, and opportunity sometimes uh, comes once in a lifetime, and uh, sometimes you just need to jump. Uh, so I did it. And you've never played in the U.S. You never played in MLS. So what did you make of the idea of coming to this league, coming to this country? Uh, as your next coaching st step, what type of research did you have people that you leaned on that know the area? Yeah, I know uh, quite a lot of people working in the, in the U.S., uh, ex-football players or football players that are now actually playing there. So uh, I knew MLS uh, quite, quite a lot. I've been there in 2017 uh, visiting Yele Van Damme when he was playing in LA Galaxy. I was watching... Uh, a game, I, I was watching trainings, I was a little bit uh, following and quite interested in, in your culture, uh, uh, that sport culture that you have in the U.S. Is, is huge, it's amazing. And I always had in, in, my, in my head, uh, the day I got the opportunity to work in the U.S., uh, I'm not going to doubt. And when DC came with this opportunity, well, a uh, decision was made uh, quite quick. Yella Van Damme, man, one of the favorites on this show. Yeah. I got to imagine you had fun in L.A. with Yella Van Damme. So tell me about your process here. I mean, you, you get an offer, you start talking to D.C. United, you start looking at the squad, I'm assuming, you start evaluating what maybe you're walking into. What did you see? Well, I saw a team who had uh, difficulties last season, who won only five games, who had difficulties to score. Uh, but we have to admit it was, was quite... Um, an unnormal season with injuries, uh, with COVID, um, and Ben also have have been doing a great job for the past uh, 10 years. I don't know how many clubs can say uh, that they that they have been working with the same manager for for 10 years. So I think it was a time to change, a time for a for a fresh air, uh, for a new start. And I'm glad DC United choose me for for that new chapter. So I know some people that cover the Belgian league and they are devastated that you are leaving because of the style of soccer you bring and the way you've coached your teams and, and see the game. Tell people out there, fans who haven't seen you play, DC fans, what is football to you? What is it that you want your teams to do? What's your focus? What's your philosophy? Well, football is my life. I wake up and I go to sleep thinking about soccer. Um, since I was a kid that I wanted to play soccer uh, as a professional, that I wanted to play in Europe, uh, that I wanted to have a long career and to live out of this. I think I'm a privilege uh, that can say that um, earns money and, and makes uh, my job uh, yeah, as well, what my passion is. Uh, I don't know how many people can say that. And about my style of play, well, talking about my passion, it's a very passionate uh, style of, of play. Uh, you can compare that with the, the, the type of coaching of uh, Simeone or Bielsa or Gallardo, uh, putting a lot of energy in our games uh, to defend and to attack, to don't let the opposition not even two seconds to, to think or to breathe. Um, it demands a lot of energy, it demands a lot of commitment. But that's the way I did it uh, with Bersco. That's the way we did it to promote first division. That's the way we did it in first division and the way we surprised many teams in Belgium. So I'm really looking forward and I hope I can bring that style and that mentality as quick as possible. You know that for every process, um, it takes quite quite a time. Uh, it's going to be hard to see results in, in short but in the long term, uh, we need to, to set a, a blueprint to, to, to step new principles and a new way of play who can surprise opponents and who can make uh, proud uh, all these United supporters. Love the Marcelo Gallardo reference there, not just because he's an amazing manager, but because he is a former DC United player, had a little bit of time there in the nation's capital. Here you come. Tell me about, and maybe we get too focused on this, maybe not. You didn't, at least by my knowledge, use a ton of wingers in your teams in Belgium. There are a number of wide players on this DC United team. How does all of this shake out formationally or do you not care about the formational side and it's just style of play, style of play? 
Yeah, that, that's that's a good question. I'm I'm quite of a flexible coach, uh, which means um, I adapt to to the squad. I I adapt to the roster to to the kind of players I have. Uh, but the principles that they remain and they stay the same. Um, but about system, um, I need to see what's the best for the players I have. If uh, I can get the best of my players in a back three defense, then we will play with back three. If, if uh, I got an important injury and I need to, to, to change, then we will play with back four. But the principles will remain the same and will stay the same. And, and that's the most important thing. We saw a lot of three five two. I think from your Beerschot team, from what I've seen, um, what do you think this roster needs? And what do you look at with DC and say, what do you have, and where do you need to go, or is all the pieces there? Um, well, I think um, there are most of the pieces are already there. Uh, of course, when you get the right players in the right positions, and you are a little bit smart uh, scouting and bringing the the, the right transfers. Uh, you can make uh, this squad uh, and this roster even even better. So it's up to me, together with Dave and the rest of the board, to to be um, inventive, to to be smart enough to find the right players uh, to make our squad uh, even stronger. But I do believe that uh, a lot of pieces in my system and in my principles are already there in this United to perform. So we're talking about what you've done in Belgium and sort of digging in, but it occurs to me, Hernan, that you are a very young manager in a lot of ways. I mean, it's been like 15, 16 months for you in this career. Tell me about becoming a manager. Tell me about sort of the latter parts of your career and building up to this point, because this is, you know, a step within that journey, but there's so much that led you to this moment. Yeah. Uh, three, four years before I stopped with my soccer career, I already started uh, studying uh, here in Belgium, uh, going to the Federation to get all my diplomas because I already have the ambition to become a, to become a coach and to stay in the football world the moment I stop uh, playing as a professional soccer player. And um, when I stopped with 36, they told me, uh, you were too old to keep on playing. When I start being a manager, they told me you are too young to be a manager. <laughs> so they will always say something. The, the, the same way they told me I was too too small to become a soccer player. Yeah, uh, they, I think it's up to us to to prove them wrong and to to follow your dreams. And that's what I'm doing. Speaking of young, I'm sure you saw over the last year a lot of young academy pieces come into the first team for DC and MLS still kind of a new process trying to figure out how to win and promote young players. What's your thought? What's your philosophy in introducing young pieces and local pieces into a club? I think uh, you have a lot of um, young talent uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, I was watching the draft. I was watching those players playing for the university. I have to say I was impressed. Uh, but what you have to give them is, is a structure, a structure and, and a lot of confidence, a lot of positive coaching. Um, so we need to build up a structure uh, based on, on, on experience, uh, experienced guys on, on key positions um, to, to make sure those young guys are not getting burned in, in, the, in, in the first minutes they, they get, that they have a solid structure to perform and to make the right steps. Um, so a lot of individual talks, a lot of uh, um, individual trainings to, to make them better. And the, that individual approach, I, I really believe, is the best one for this new generation. You talk about experienced players. I think one of the ones that we thought we'd see a lot from last year, and you said how weird a year was, was Edson Flores. He was the DP, the big name, the Peruvian international. What have you seen, how he can fit in to your game, what you can help improve? And I don't know if you've spoken with him yet. No, I didn't have the, the chance to talk uh, with the players yet. Um, that's something we plan to do the, the, the coming days. Uh, but of course, he's an important player for us. Uh, I mean, uh, when you see our squad, uh, I see many players that maybe didn't perform the way DC was expecting. And I really hope that I'm the right manager for them to bring them to the right level, the level we expect. And that's one of the of the main points uh, of being a manager, of being a head coach, uh, to make your players better, not only in a collective way, but also in an individual way. Looking at the league as a whole, Hernan, 
we always talk, and on this show, we really just dive into everything, where it's going, tactically, transfers, the culture, across the board. When you look at Major League Soccer as you prepare to take this job, and as you did in previous years and talk to the folks that you know around the league, what is your perception of MLS? Its strengths, maybe its weaknesses, where it's going, what it can become? I believe that MLS... um... In, in, in a short period, will become one of the biggest competitions uh, in the world. Um, why? Because you already have something that may, that, for example, many clubs in Belgium don't have, and that's the infrastructure and the organization. Uh, from that point of view, you are number one in the world, and the moment you have that, uh, you have a lot, a lot of uh, better chances or bigger chances to succeed and to give that infrastructure that young players need to perform. You don't see any more... Uh, all superstars go into the MLS to finish their careers. You all also see now nowadays, especially the last couple of seasons, a lot of young talents from all uh, Latin America making their next steps to perform and to improve, to then make uh, the jump to Europe or to a better competition. So the MLS is not anymore that competition uh, where all big stars say goodbye. It's also a competition where uh, young talents are, are coming and arriving to improve and to make this competition even better. All right, before we let you go, because I know people are wondering, and I'm wondering, uh, Mark McKenzie just got sold to Gank. You know the Belgian League better than we do, man. What is Mark McKenzie, the center back from the Philadelphia Union and uh, young U.S. national teamer, walking into with Gank? Huh, good question. Well, first of all, uh, it's one of the better teams, bigger teams in, in Belgium. They have a, an unbelievable uh, good academy a good infrastructure, uh, an offensive uh, mentality. They, they like to win and to play for titles. So I think he made the right step and, and a very good choice. There you have it. Straight from the mouth of Hernan Osada. We look forward to seeing what your D.C. teams do. Look forward to welcoming you into this league, Hernan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot and hope to see you soon. All right, big thanks to Aaron Lasada for uh, giving us his time. I'm very, very interested to see what DC United look like in 2021 and beyond. Let's get to the mailbag, 401-2060 MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Take it away, Dave. Let's start with Dave Capone, who says, Hey, guys, love the show. Generally entertaining. Insightful look into soccer with some truly great analysis from greater minds than mine. Did he say generally entertaining? I'm reading it. I mean, right that's here. good, but it. You yeah, know, but he also said great minds. So you've got that. Okay, yeah. Okay. Who so he went back and forth. Yeah. Who he, can he laid it on thick in the right spots. The intricacies of American soccer with great grace and care. This podcast oh. is often among some of the best things I listen to. That wow. being said, if Weeby keeps opening the show with from a basement in Kansas City, I have a moral obligation to stop listening. We're all better than this. I know we are. <laughs> <from regard. laughs> oh, boy. Uh. I'm just trying to accurately describe my circumstances here. People don't you know. want accuracy, Andrew. People so how don't do want I? To know okay, about so that. help me out here. How do I like glamorize this? How do I make this? How do I? You know, from New York, New York felt, you know, and Bed Stuy, you know, I, yeah, apartment wasn't glamorous, but it had something to it. Yeah, there were pops. From now, Midwest, the only pops you're hearing are from the furnace. From the Midwest MLS studios in Kansas oh. City, Missouri. I like that. Yeah, I'm jazz it up Weedy a little bit, make it official. With my partners in soccer. Yeah, from the David continent. Gossett, yeah, here we go. Here we go. From and the... this is extra time presented or driven by Continental. By Continental. Um, from the, the Flyover the Studios end? in beautiful, historic Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know. I'll, I'll workshop this. From Thank you so deep much for part of the Midwest. Yes, from the heartland. America's heartland. <laughs> yeah, Dave Capone. Well, that's a great name. That's a great name, Dave. I appreciate we, go. we got the, another uh, Dave email. email here. A lot of days this week. Uh, He says, hi, guys, big fan of the show. There's one question I've always been wondering for the past six years or so, and I finally decided that today is the day I'm going to email you and ask. Goss, many, many years ago, you walked out of the show when Simon called you out for making a mistake. Can't really recall why he was upset with you. What happened that day? Were you putting on a show or did you really storm out? Ever since that show, I imagine Goss was a very bitter and angry person. Yep, yep. But since you guys started streaming on YouTube, I realized he is gentle, funny, and a kind guy. Mm. Also sounds accurate. However, mm. I must say that we be sharing stories of you getting to fights at co-ed soccer games aligns <laughs> with my initial image that I made of you after I heard about it. Weeby, well, do you remember me walking out of a show? I don't remember you walking out of a show. But so Simon think- said a lot of, th- like, I felt like Simon said a lot of out there stuff. 
So actually, when Simon was on, it was really easy to know your lane, which was to just, like, your lane, my lane, anybody's lane, Nick Fershaw's lane, which was just to rail against the insanity that he would bring, and it just made for great radio every time. I remember walking out of some of those studios, or not studios, conference rooms with a, <laughs> with a clanky heater, and just being jacked up, like, oh my god, I can't believe he said that, I really came back, and then you listen back, and like, he ran circles around me, but I don't remember. I don't remember I do remember there was a bit where he fired me? because I think we had audio issues on a Kyle Beckerman interview. That's the only thing I think this could be associated with. And I remember getting a lot of people being like, hey man, if you need help with anything, and it was like, no, it was a joke. Simon didn't really just fire me on the show. That would be pretty bad. So I don't know. We had a pretty janky Zoom recorder back in the day. Like it was (laughs) like, it really, it really struggled at times. I also remember a time, uh, speaking of technical issues on this show, and maybe it was like a, you know, it, it, an indication of what was going to be in the future. Remember we did that interview with Charlie Davies? Really heartfelt interview all about him, like, overcoming these odds and his entire story. And he just, like, poured it all out for us and his upbringing. And we got done with the interview and we're like, oh, my God, that was so good. And then we looked at the memory card and it was gone. And we literally called Charlie back and he did the entire interview over and didn't complain even a little bit about it. And I was like, this guy. This guy is awesome. And now he's on the show with us. That's cool, too. Anything else we got? Uh, we got a quick USMNT one, which is if we had a win tomorrow game and everyone's an option, including Nagby, Chandler, and Opara, who starts at striker and who starts in the game? So this person had Stefan, Dest, uh, Ike, Brooks, Chandler, Nagby, Adams, West, Weston, Reyna, and Pulisic on the wings, and then no center forward. This is an opportunity for you, Doyle, if you'd like to react. Um, Doyle, so that that Timmy Chandler got me. I'm I'm (laughs) shook. I'm shook by the Timmy Chandler inclusion. Who are you going to start him over? You going to start him over Dust or Cannon or Anthony Robinson or like where are you going to play Timmy Chandler? How did he work his way in there? Um, I, you know, the Opara thing is tough because if if things have gone differently with him in 2017, he's starting. Uh, for the U.S. national team in Cuba, and we we make the World Cup because he doesn't have the holler of a game that uh, that Omar did. Um, but at this point, it's like the the that book is closed, it, and it's it sucks because like would have been I think one of the best defenders we ever had. It, it would be my guess is it would be John Brooks and Aaron Long at center back, maybe Matt Miazga instead. Um, you know, if you want to be pedantic about it, this, you know, we have a, a must win game tomorrow. Well, Matt Miazga is in season. Aaron Long is not. So probably Miazga um, up top. It's, it's probably Jossie Zarda still at this point. Um, but, you know, one of the things about uh, this year is that we have a lot of good young forwards from Matthew Hoppy to Daryl DK to Io Akinola, Jeremy Abobasi, who have all played really, really well. And I think all of them have the talent to push through and become that number one choice. I will say that it wouldn't be Josie Altidore. Um, I, I, you know, Josie's still the most talented forward in, in the pool, but I would not trust him to go 90 minutes in an international. And I hope that uh, Greg Berhalter really transitions him to like a super sub role. Would Nagby uh, be in this team? No, no. If he chose to play, he wouldn't start no. with those other two. No, uh, like I'm, you, you don't start Darlington Nagby over Tyler Adams in Weston McKenney. And, and no, Nagby, he has them in a three. I don't know. I, still no. Lejet so, is a better player than Nagby. Okay. So uh, like uh, Nagby is is really amazing with his ball security, um, which is a, a really fine trait, uh, and he does open up the game for other guys with that, but he doesn't win the ball back enough to be a six. Um, and he doesn't make progressive passes. This is how he can't really be a number eight. If you look at his passing maps, it's all side to side. Uh, so he's just like, he, he's, he is what he is. And I understand why people love him, but for this team, no, I, I, I would not. And, and then like the, the bigger argument is does legit start at the 10 or do you move Raina inside and have Timmy Weah on one of the wings or Jordan Morris on one of the wings? You didn't even want to answer this question. You like wanted to avoid this thing. And then you just laid it all out for us. That's the Doyle that we love. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And I appreciate Tommy Scoops. Sorry, I just want to do that. I just like his nickname oh so goodness. much. And thank you to Hernan Lasada for joining us as well. Anyway, enjoy your weekend, everybody. We'll be back on Monday, and we'll talk to you then.